this speaking on generates a prize on mission sheriff on plus acceptance of gaps and risks. In fact, they don't regard them as gaps and risks. They regard them as avenues and opportunities. It's only a gap and risk if you're not confident. If you're setting things up, then it's an avenue and opportunity. You let them come through and cut us, cut into ribbons. It is a risk if you think it is a risk. It is a gap if you think it's a gap. But if you think it's an avenue, as an opportunity to hose the guy. It's a mental, it's a mindset problem. It's a mindset problem. That's why I got quotes around gaps and risks. Gaps is an avenue, and risk is an opportunity. Echelon of depth. <laughs> Always echelon of depth, because that gives you a basis to judge. You got everybody up forward, you get behind you, first you lose your whole force. Reserve. Keep reconstituting, setting up all the time. Only use what you have to keep reconstituting your reserves, because that gives you the basis for adjusting in the future, generating uncertainty in his mind, and dealing with uncertainty. And then your positions, we talked about before, keep changing those. So the guy you're presenting. Very ambiguous, deceptive, or uncertain picture. He can't understand what you're up to. It makes it very, he doesn't know how to deal with it. <coughs> See, when a guy can sand tape with you, that means, you know, you're predictable. You know, you've heard of where they sand tape. Well, here's what you're doing. Now you're predictable. You want to make it so he can never sand tape with you. With that in mind, let's go on and look at Gorilla Conagro. Some key points here. Remember, they need cause for the people in the crisis room. It's really the government's own thing. What I'm saying, crisis and vanguard represent the American instability initiative. That great is vanguard. Hence, if that's occurred, if that's occurred, <coughs> and those are the root causes, we should be going after that. In the time of That's what we should be doing. Not search and destroy. Okay, so look at the kind of drill again. Pretty busy chart one chart. It's the kind of things we should have been doing. You might see my bullet down here, right? Asterisk. The bottom. <laughs> you got my asterisk? You better start getting the other side, otherwise life's going to get goddamn uncomfortable. You see, you better get with the program. That's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> Why lose? It's more fun to win. Huh? But know what we're doing here. These two bullets are the most important because it really sets up everything else. These two are very important. That's what makes say here. Sets up everything else, and then you play the game. You don't get that right, you don't even get to play a lot of those others. That's why the first two are very important. That sets up the rest. Instead, we start operating at this level, don't pay attention to it, go on and on and on, never get there. The ideas are actually very simple. But for some reason, we resist the goddamn thing. I mean, really, the ideas are very simple. Maybe that's why we don't like them. They're not, they're not sophisticated enough. I don't know. Well, you see, they're very simple ideas. They're very useful. said importance of popular support. And the reason why it really comes out because that's a lot of basis for your intelligence. And you, that really gives you, in other words, in a sense, when you get the people on your side, then the, the government's blind. Or if you're the government, you can get them stuck away from, from the gorillas. The gorillas become blind. They don't know what's going on. <coughs> you know, just don't think of formal intelligence operations. Social and military. Those people up there, enormous intelligence. If you exploit it and take advantage of it. In fact, there was an interesting case during World War II, which got me on to this, to see that so, so beautiful. And I saw it, but really, they get the, really inside me, get the finger spits of the fuel for it. Was I read, I can't remember what book I read it in, but it was a very interesting story they're talking about. It was a historical uh, account of uh, an American advisor, I believe it was 
might have been a Marine, I'm not sure, but with the uh, Chinese Communist Eighth Root Army over in China, either prior or during World War II. I think it was prior to World War II, they were working. And uh, they were going against the Chinese nationalists or something. Or, I mean, against, no, it was against the Japanese, it was at that time. And uh, <laughs> it's really interesting. So the, the communist commander said, I want you to look at my operation and critique it. See, like that. He can tell me what I'm doing wrong. See, so the guys are about to get three axes and came back. Jesus Christ, you know, no patrols, no recce. You know, that's bullshit. you got to get those guys out there. See. And the communist commander just smiled. He says, no, we don't need that recce. And the guy says, why not? He says, we got all the people out there. They're all recce. We know exactly what those, ask, those other people are doing. That was intelligence. The recce operation. All the people. I don't have any pictures. How we got them? That's all those people are doing. Here. That means they really understood the intelligence directing operation. All kinds of things. The guy was really interesting. Very important. I'm not saying you should dispense with it, but he's trying to make a point. He had that. Okay, let's get into categories of conflict. We've gone through all this stuff, and now we start wrapping up. Okay, if you recall, in the beginning, we've gone through this, this sort of cycle, we get divided up three ways. There's another three ways you can divide up. Attrition, warfare, maneuver, conflict, and moral. Attrition, these are, these are not exhaustive examples, they're just some interesting examples. Attrition, warfare is practiced by the people of maneuver, conflict. And no, we're talking about attrition, warfare is practiced by the Emperor in Poland, and maneuver, conflict by uh, General Bonaparte as well as the Long. Plus, Stonewall Jackson, Grant. <coughs> And Americans under Patton and MacArthur, a little differently. Patton primarily in the operational sense, and MacArthur primarily in the strategic sense. In that sense, they operate at different levels, but they were doing it. It's an immoral one, practice by the Mongols and most of the world Very few kind of them, and I say, say, if you want. Really understand. Now, let's examine those in order. First, some attrition observations. Firepower is a destructive force is king. You know, you really want to fill up the body count and smash all those targets out there. That's king. Everything else is subordinate to firepower. Protection. Whether it be trenches, armor, dispersion, they're used to weaken or dilute the effects of enemy firepower. Mobility. To bring firepower to bear or evade enemy firepower. You measure success on how body count and targets destroy. Not only that, pretty soon you start getting interested in terrain objectives, violating Napoleon's dictum to destroy enemy armor. You want to take out the force, then you own to it. Okay, if we pull all that together, we can get an idea of the essence of attrition warfare. Destructive force, whether it be no weapon, mechanical, chemical, etc., to kill, maim, or otherwise generate widespread destruction. Protection, to minimize the enemy doing the same thing to you. And mobility, either to bring it to bear or move away from your adversary. And the payoff, break enemy's will to resist. Remember, we can do this with the words. Seize and hold terrain. Aim, compel an enemy to surrender and sue for peace. We've been said it many times. You know they've got to show up. If they don't show up, it's not so good. What kind of image do you get out of that, anybody? Fuel. That's one. Fuel. That's not a bad one. self defeating Another one. But what I'm trying to tell you, if you look at this, there's not much moral or mental content, it's, it's high physical content. Remember we talked about the different levels of moral, mental, and physical? This just has a physical dimension. You're not playing the moral and mental. In fact, you might be playing the moral and mental dimension against yourself by doing that. So you're really, your emphasis on the physical content. You're not playing the moral or mental content. Okay? Now let's go on a maneuver. Observation regarding maneuver. We do these kinds of ambiguity, deception, novelty, mobility, etc. Generate. Fire and movement are <laughs> in combination. But people think maneuver is just movement. No, it's fire and movement used in combination. Like chain G or thing. Tie up the bird or drain away the idea is to generate. It exposes vulnerabilities and get at those weaknesses. Okay? And the indication of success are no longer quantitative or qualitative. Any phenomena that suggests inability to adapt to change. In fact, Guderian, going through France, he said, now's the time to go for it. The French army's falling apart. The commander, you just go for it. In other words, you just sensed it. 
It's just like you can sense in a basketball game when people, the other team's falling apart, the other guy's scoring. What's the first thing the guys do? Time, boy, we got to get our act back together. Can't measure that. Okay, so then if we paste all that together, here's the essence of that. You want to generate alternative competing events of, in a guy's mind as many as possible. Can't figure out what the hell's going on. That's ambiguity. It may or may not be. What you're trying to generate is mental confusion and disorder, so we can't cope with the unfolding circumstances. That's what ambiguity is. Deception, an impression of events is there or not. Really a neat picture, only it's a wrong picture of what's going on. Let's juxtapose them. If you look at ambiguity, it's easier to generate than deception. In other words, you generate confusion and disorder rapidly than you can generate an order, even though it's a false order. It takes longer to generate a deception over ambiguity. Ambiguity is also less risky than deception. It's less risky. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have a deception. The Normandy, the, the Normandy case is a good example. Because if you can realize it, you get enormous leverage out of deception. But remember, it's riskier and it takes longer. We really didn't understand that during World War II. In fact, I don't think many of us understand it to this day. Let me give you an example. Operation Torch, invasion of North Africa. They set up a big de deception campaign. We got on, you know, virtually got on scot free. We had some problems later on after we were driving on it. We got in there, got a free ride in. But then, after they looked at it, they had, decept they had a critique on it. The deception masters had to admit they didn't, the deception campaign didn't succeed. Said they said it was a success of security. But when you read into it, Christ, the Germans didn't know what we were going to do. They had all, we created all kinds of impressions, so it was a success of ambiguity. That's what it was. And normally it's the opposite case. We had a lot of time to set that thing up. Lots of time. So we created, in the German mindset, the idea that we were going to come in a party clay area. And even after we landed at Normandy, we kept up the deception so they think it was only a secondary effort. And they still had that for over 30 days in their mind while well, we were, our whole effort was in Normandy. Which is an extraordinary deception. In other words, they didn't stop it once we landed. They kept it going all the time, thinking we were still going to land it. And to show you we didn't understand it, once again in Italy, they said, how come we couldn't get our deception to work there? And they said, we didn't have time. Christ, we're exploiting an existing situation after Sicily to go into Italy. And that's the advantage of an ambiguity. You don't need a lot of time. Deception takes time to set up. And that's what Blitzkrieg does. Once you may have an initial deception, but once you start writing, you're writing on what? You're writing on ambiguity, not on deception. You can't stop the operation set up a new deception. You write on ambiguity. And exploit an existing situation. And another thing, novelty. That's one thing technology gives you, or new ideas. In other words, create situations the guy's never been aware of before. He didn't know what to do. He's never experienced it before. Whether it's technology, whether you've got a new wrinkle on how to set up an operation or whatever. You face a novel situation. Can't cope. And the fast changing maneuvers, not only rapid, but also irregular rapid, so you can't get an image of what's going on. And your effort directed against those features that permit him to retain his organic wholeness. So if you pull all those together, what's your payoff? What you're deliberately trying to do is generate a disorientation in his mind, a mismatch between what he anticipates and that which he must react to to survive. A mismatch. Now, if you think about that, you can redefine surprise. Surprise is nothing more than a disorientation. It doesn't say that, but that's what it is. You can get it either from ambiguity, except for any combination. It may take a long period of time, but generally, it's a disorientation generated by perceiving an extreme change. It doesn't mean it happened over a short period of time. You perceive it. All of a sudden, you say, my God, what happened? Maybe it working itself out for a long time, or maybe just speed. So surprise is nothing more than a form of disorientation. Likewise, shock. Except in this case, shock is so awesome, it's a paralyzing crisis. You don't know what to do. You go into a state of shock. So I look at shock as nothing more than a hard surprise. You look at surprise as soft shock. They're both forms of disorientation. And disrupt the state of being split apart, broken up, or torn asunder. So always think you're trying to realize this kind of an aim. <coughs> but 
But now we've done something interesting here. Since we define surprise and shock as a form of disorientation, why not just remove it from the board and look at disorientation and disruption? Before we do that, let's look at it a little bit more carefully. We may want to do it, but let's look at it a little bit more carefully. When you begin to examine it, this is this notes directly. You can also say surprise and shock also can be represented as an overload beyond one's immediate ability to respond or adapt. In other words, they can't respond or adapt because of that sense of surprise or shock or both. So what you really want to do is put it up put them in an overload condition so they can't respond. So we'll just take out surprise and shock on the next chart and substitute overload. Not that we don't want to surprise or shock them. But another way of looking at the right left side is still the same. I'm just adjusting the right side. So I get disorientation, disruption, and overload. So that's what you're trying to disrupt the, disorient the guy, disrupt the guy, and overload. Then you realize this aim or totally in state of that way. So maneuver warfare is just not a bunch of guys going down the highway at high speed. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Not just a bunch of guys going down the highway at high speed. There's movement. So if you look at this, the content of this has a heavy what? Mental content. Whereas attrition has a heavy what? Physical content. So we're back to the moral, mental, and physical. The attrition is related primarily to the physical, the maneuver related to the mental. So you can leverage that guy. Remember what I said? Terrain doesn't fight wars, machines don't fight wars. People do it and use their minds. That's exactly what we're working on here. So don't let yourself be sucked into the thing of all maneuver warfare is a bunch of troops going to high speed down some highway or across some plane in a tank or something. There are a bunch of tanks. Okay. Okay, with that in mind, let's look at the morals. The morals is here. And I got this from Paul. Very good. And when he made very clear this thing, no fixed recipe for organization, communication, tactics, and leadership. Variety. Remember, you want to remain unpredictable. Wide freedom for subordinates to exercise imagination, yet harmonized within the intent of superior commanders. Brings out a heavy reliance upon moral instead of material support as basis for cohesion and ultimate success. And what he says is that commanders must create a bond and breadth of experience based upon trust, not mistrust. The most important thing you can do is build up a bond of trust between the commander and the subordinates or among the subordinates themselves. Because when you do that, then you got an organic hole. And if you don't do it, you don't have it. And when the squeeze comes on, you're going to come apart. Well, how is this atmosphere achieved? I only know one way, by example. The leaders have to set the example. If they're going to be a leader, they're going to have to set the example. If they don't want to set the example, kick the bastards out. Or at least don't put them in a situation that goddamn is going to pull you apart. You have to set the example. You're going to, you, know, you want to run the show. If you want to be good, and you like to win, which I, sort of, I, th I think that's more attractive than losing. I don't know why I have that funny feeling. It's a lot more fun winning than losing. So that's the only way. You have to have the physical energy, mental agility, and moral authority, which means back to the trust. You've lost, when, you lie, when it's mistrust, you've lost your moral authority. There's none there. Remember a few years back, they want to have morale officers. There's only one guy responsible for morale. Who's that? You're goddamn right. If you have to have morale officers, the commander just said he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Exactly right. So what is the price? It really isn't the price. I use the word. Courage to share danger, discomfort at the front. You've got to be able to share that with your people. Understand what they're going up. Also, they respect you. You're willing to do that. And they understand you're out there playing the game, too. Also, to get a feeling for what that was going on. Willingness to support and promote unconventional or difficult subordinates. Accept danger, demonstrate initiative, take risks, come up with new ideas, etc., etc. In fact, in an old German equivalent to our OER, Officer Technical Report, they had a code word in there that they put in there and they wanted the guy to get promoted. 
This guy is a difficult subordinate. That meant promote early. And our system is two. Because they recognize when you get this kind of a guy with these kind of characteristics, he's going to be difficult. Because the system's not used to it. He's trying to change ways to make them better. He's a pain in the ass to a lot of people. Because they get nice and comfortable doing things the same old way. They've got all these preconceptions in their mind. They're very comfortable with the way the world's going on. And so this guy's come on like, son of a bitch, get rid of him. Big mistake. Huge mistake. It's going to give your organization vitality. Now, you know, if he goes too far, he gets a little bit of stroke, and then you've got to have to hold him down. In the meantime, you're going to have to give him a little leash, give him some headway, because that's the vitality. That's your ability to thrive <coughs> and grow. Win rather than lose. Be adaptable rather than rich. Dedication resolve and face up. Another thing, face up master income that fly in the face of the so-called traditional solution. Now, if you can do these things, the benefit is you'll have internal simplicity that permits rapid adaptability because you have an organic hole. And you can make those adjustments. And if you don't, you're going to have detail orders, move like molasses in January, everybody going off in the wrong direction, you're still trying to control it. You think one thing you don't have is the very thing you want, control. See, it's through those bonds of trust, that common outlook, that's where your control exists. Not through having a guy slavishly do this or do that or do this, and treat him like an automaton or a robot. In fact, some of the latest management guys, they say your control exists, you read some of the management stuff, so I'm going to hit you with it. Control exists through what? But with your what? It's through your value system. Your systems of values and the things that are important. That's where your control exists. And if you've got that common thing, you've got control. And our management people are just beginning to wake up to that. Some of them, I'll say. Go ahead. We have a guerrilla war to fight with the American people on that issue. A friendly guerrilla war. Well, a friendly girl. Well, yeah, I know. I don't understand what you're saying, but it, it's we don't want to make it a hostile. But it's a friendly girl. No, I understand what you're it's saying. It's one that has to be not fought, or else we cannot. We can't act. No problem. Get but, but we get, but we got to inculcate that. But it's what I call a friendly girl award. We don't want to make any of them. We're going to say, hey, there's a game that can be played here. We're all part of the team. I mean, I think that's what you're suggesting, right? Yeah. Am I, did, I, did I misread you? Oh, no, sir. I, I hope I didn't. The, uh, maybe, maybe I did. The, uh, no, I don't think so. The uh, President was recently criticized by the Reagan for, for having that style of management, and it was uh, the same style of management. In other words, he delegated, he, trucked, he uh, had a value system, he closed that value system on his subordinates. As long as you hold the value system. Well, when his subordinates, when one of his difficult subordinates uh, got difficult, the American people then have to understand, well, this is going to happen, he's now going to take that under control. When it surfaces. Reagan has been admired for, de for defending his subordinates. You know, he might have made some mistakes, but one thing he's been admired for is for defending his subordinates. Sometimes he might have gone too far. The guy's a bastard in, in violating the value. See, if a guy violates those value systems, too, you know, you, you're, he's earned discipline and, uh, you know, stringent measures of these. Because you've given him an opportunity to act within that value system, you give freedom of action. If he goes against that, you know, you can't give him a free load because other people are going to do it. The whole thing comes apart. The gorilla war I'm talking about is the press came on on the side of. You don't know what your people are doing. Or the press should take a side of, well, nobody can know what everybody's doing. All they have to do is recognize <coughs> But then we have to educate the press. Say, look, you know, you know all what your editor do. I could hit the press back. Oh, you're one of these goddamn geniuses. You know exactly everything that's going on in your paper, huh? But the only No, you do know that, Mr. Reporter. Of course, he has to say, no, this is, you know, why do you expect me to then? You know, put them on the goddamn defense or stick it up their rear. They don't know either. You guys took that out of context and you said impose the value system. I don't think you're, you're this proof. You, you don't want to impose it. See, that's a relative no. to importance to an individual, like you, you, know, you were alluding to earlier. You don't impose it. Well, yes, sir. You don't. I mean, I, you might have that context. So you, you, you don't want to impose it, but you want to show them a, a set of values that's going to be <laughs> beneficial to them as well as yourself in that. That's what's got to be done. In other words, they got to readily accept those values. 
They got to be able to inculcate it within themselves. Well, and that can be done. A friendly guerrilla war because that's why I call it a friendly guerrilla war. We all have those values. It's just that it, it's sort of like the same issue with, with right. When, when uh, we accept them when it's going our way, we don't accept them when it's going against. That's right. But see, there's a lot of people there. That's what I'm trying to say. So if you one little narrow group gets the benefit, and everybody else is getting screwed. They got to go. You can't do that. You're going to pull the organization apart. That's like having clicks. You know, that's what hurts organizations. You get a little click inside, and they're taking care of themselves and opposing everybody else, but making trying to make it look otherwise. We've seen that. I've seen it in other organizations. It's bad. Okay? So here's a book that I read right shortly after I uh, talked to Paul, and I got to think for 25 cents. <coughs> I read his book. I just ran into one of the bookstores, and I had to be hey, this is very interesting. And these pages particularly got it. That's the real ball. And the underlines are mine. And I'll let you read it. But nobody's talking about it. If you look at all three pages, they're all related to each other. One case, two cases, the problem. first two cases are 124, 161, the World War I, 165, about the uh, German Army, World War II. The big one is more of a In this particular case up here, this person, you know, they're experiencing things they never experienced before, and they're having a hard time coming to grips with it. Now, I'm going to define moral differently, Mike. If you want to hear my, if we get around, I give you my strategy for you. <coughs> There's another way of looking at moral. I think it's more profound and more powerful. But this is a way of looking at it. It's okay. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Okay? Now, thinking about that, let's see if we can make some sense of all this. And so what we got here, some insights regarding Paul's statement and Paul's ideas. From Paul's comments, we know. You take all this stuff in a quick lens, show that these words and phrases are all directly related to one another. All those phrases that I underlined, even though they're different times, they're all very much directly related to one another. That's one point. Going further, we can see that his comments in his page, what do they say? The moral effects, in some sense, are related to the menace posed by the Zeppelin and the dive bombers, and the uncertainty shows us not knowing what to expect or how to deal with. Because that's the, that's the message he's bringing out to you. Whether you like it or not, that's the message. So it puts simply, from that viewpoint, moral effects are related to menace and uncertainty. That's the first cut. So I say for a first cut, this suggests that moral strength represents mental capacity to overcome menace and uncertainty. But you know, we're left a little bit uneasy with that. On the other hand, it seems to leave out something humans either need or must overcome for collective moral strength, rather than bringing in the organic whole. So we've got to remember, going back and look at some of Brevin's, remember those drill commanders, they're trying to stress propaganda, civil disorders. They're trying to generate mistrust so they can pull the government down and then build a bonds of trust for their own, for the people they're trying to swing over to their side. And Balk emphasized the importance of trust, not mistrust. That being the case, then we're getting on to something, recognizing that these guys really know how to operate in environments. It says moral strength, in some sense, represents mental capacity to overcome menace, uncertainty, and mistrust. Overcome it anyway, moral strength. Go out of that mistrust, trust the man. That being the case, we can start making some definitions here. Then. Start giving some ideas back to how's with that. Remember, we talked about it. those things that bring out fear, anxiety, and alienation, or the counter counterweights, courage, confidence, and spree. So, moral, we already said what moral strength is. Moral victory is a triumph of courage, confidence, and spree over fear, anxiety, and alienation when confronted by menace and certain mistrust. In other words, you're bringing out those positive virtues rather than those, what we call those more negative qualities. Well, we have it as human beings. We have these things. Fear and anything. Well, you want to be able to bring these, well, these up over these, and therefore you can deal with that menace and certainty and mistrust. That's what you want to be able to deal with. That. Moral defeat, of course, is just the opposite. In that case, fear, anxiety, and alienation, they well up, the others suppress, two of Moral values, those that permit one to carry on in the face of that. Moral authority, that person or body or, that permits you to deal with that, of course. So now, by pulling it apart and bringing it all back together again, we come up with a, in essence, a moral conflict. So 
great exploit. These can menace, uncertainty, mistrust. Here's the idea. It serves fear and condemnation in order to generate many non cooperative oh, yeah. The aim is very simple. The struggle is more of one that permit an organic whole to exist. But does that chart bother anybody? It should bother me. I'm trying to get at something here. And this is my and this follow on chart. If you think about that a little bit, it's all one side. What I'm doing here is the essence of moral conflict was presented in this previous chart. It tends to take the negative or dark side. So let's see if we can bring out the positive side. In other words, the courage, confidence, and spree represent the positive kind of ways to do it. What are the positive kind of ways to mess and serve and destroy? So let's see if we can kind of do this. Way. And we'll begin to look at it, you begin to see some here. You work it backwards, you begin to say, okay. The presence of mistrust implies a rupture or loosening of human bonds. You have to build up harmony in a group in order to build up that trust. So that seems to be a kind of way. In dealing with uncertainty, you can't say we're going to have certainty. All you have to do is you have to be adaptable. That's the only way you can deal with uncertainty. You have to be adaptable. Build adaptability and flexibility in organization to deal with it. But life is inherently uncertain. Don't say well, we're just going to have certainty. That's bullshit. You're not going to get it. You may think you are, it's not. And with respect to uh, menace, the only way you can deal with that, you have to take initiative. You can't sit there. So if you pull all that together, then we can reconstruct that previous chart, the essence, we'll leave the left side the same, and we have the negative factors as well as the counterweights. It's a way of dealing with it. I haven't changed the left side, it's called negative factors. Counterweights, initiative, internal drive of thinking, and adaptability, harmony. <clears throat> then you got a negative aim as well as a positive aim. Now you can see it from both sides of the argument. We want to get the negative in our atmosphere, we want the positive on our side, obviously. And that's what was a grill is where they see it this way. That's what they instinctively they're doing all the time. They're trying to build up the negative atmosphere in their adversaries, and they're trying to build up the positive atmosphere in their system. Remember what Napoleon said, the moralist and the physical is three to one. They understand it where they know those numbers on they're using that in a very Powerful way. Okay, it's 10 o'clock, so I think we got to stop it tonight. I guess we're going to have to get together and take the synthesis later on and spend a lot of time on it. And the risk stuff goes fast. We can set that up, Mike, if you want to set that up. But I'm going to be here for a while. Okay. But we've done the hard part, and the rest of it goes very rapidly. And so all we have to do now is do the synthesis, the application, and the uh, and the wrap up, and that that goes very rapidly. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to pull it all. All these things we look at, we're going to pull it all together. What are we really talking about? Any questions before we leave tonight? So we'll just we'll, we'll just tune it for tonight on that because you know, I find out it's kind of We took a lot of time to make those digressions, but I think they're important because we're trying to address certain issues and people want to. Get to it, and I feel okay. If we want to get to it, we're going to get to it. It takes time. And you're suggesting we do it next week sometime. Well, we'll, 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 we'll get together. I'm not going back. I don't see how we can do it this week. No problem. I understand. Right, nobody probably wants to, and so uh, so we'll, we'll we'll set it up. Uh, we'll it's okay with you. So we get the synthesis and the wrap up. So one of your wrap ups, wrap ups has to be how we adapt this to a nine month curriculum for 35 year old majors. <laughs> Well, no, it is even bigger than that because we're talking about yeah, the corporate well, leadership yeah. from corporate majority. Yeah. So our whole profession. So you want these guys from the lowest guy all the way up to the commander right. general to have this, these attitudes? Corporate general, you've got to cover the whole spectrum. I, I, They're I, all part of the team. Well, we do a pretty good job. Right, right. really. Huh? I, I think we need Not corporate, corporate, private. I want to go from the private all the way up to the common. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we do a pretty good job on the corporate yeah. below that was when we get to our lieutenants that we. We don't trust them, and we don't we don't give them the, the, the leeway for initiative. See, so in order to do this, you can't do it. They get the the spree, the trust, the the uh, so in order to do this, you have to educate all your people, not just piece of them. Play the game because you really want to build up this whole organic philosophy. So you can operate as a family, like just like a family, really like a family. We say you know we operate like a family. You know, a lot of it's hype. It's not quite that. You really want to do all be able to operate like a family, and uh, and it's, you're very large. You know, but then you want to have that, the whole family's got the finger spits in the field. You understand what I'm saying? You want to get them all at finger spits. But, but on, on a larger scale, what we were talking about from the 
been talking about this idea of this work on the concept and repeated application of peacetime so it becomes <coughs> uh, inherent in the well, missing procedures to do that in wartime. But in the peacetime sense, he, here's the idea. Uh, to repeatedly do it, the practice of peacetime what we want to do in wartime. The trust, the only other thing. So what's missing in my mind are the, the education training tools to take this. Oh yeah. And you're gonna we're gonna have to develop that. So you get that so you have you can inculcate it, it becomes a natural part of the whole system, and that's what you're really saying. You want to make it very natural. Where is Not some so foreign substance. No. When we were talking about um, I, I just use the term as an example. Yeah. I mean here you have a society that for a number of reasons places a very high value on education. And we don't do that. I mean, and, and I think therein lies the difficulty. I mean, if education comes natural and it's something we know how to do, that would make the job a little bit easier. But it's not. It's not. We give out the diplomas, and sometimes not for a whole lot of education. <laughs> well, yeah, but that's kind of all over. You know, it's unfortunate. You know, like, that's why the, the sergeant's comments are quite applicable. <laughs> the military is not the only one that has this problem. You know, you look at industry, industry got some horrible problems. Yeah, it's a society wide problem. We've got a big problem. We're going to have, you know, we somehow we've got to, we've got to pull it together. We're having problems in the I was saying to this gentleman here uh, during the break, I, I think maybe uh, the, the Marine Corps has a better chance of solving that problem than any other thing in the society. I, I just think maybe that, idealistically, I think that. But I look around and I see we've got some control over our future. And, and uh, the other services are too big, the rest of society is too chaotic. And in a sense, somebody's going to have to set the example. If somebody doesn't set the example, the rest aren't going to do it anyway. Sure. I'm trying to think of an example where a, where a military organization would, uh, could function, uh, at least it, for some period of time, uh, by using menace and uncertainty and distrust. Uh, you know, can, it really, can that be done? I guess one example, and I know it's not a good example, I mean, is uh, Shaka Zulu and the way you brought the Zulu tribes together by just killing anybody that screwed up and uh, and, and uh, driving them to the point of, of uh, utter fear and, and exhaustion. And uh, yeah, he was successful against the British for, for quite a few years until he went uh, went bonkers and his brother-in-law put a spear to him. But, well, if he's done that, what kind of a culture do you have in order to do that in? And did we misread that? Is that what we're saying? Because, uh, you know, he's the enemy and he's a bad guy, so we want to constitute all evil in him, and we want to have constitute all good in ourselves. You know, I, I'm very worried about I, I'm very worried about that, having seen that happen before. So since, he, since he's the enemy, God damn it, he's all evil, and he's done everything wrong, and we're pure and all that. And well, the Soviets and their KGB and, and the way they, uh, you know... I'm not saying he didn't Stalin, do that. Yeah. Well, Stalin's the son of him. Yet we ascribed to him when during World War II he wasn't, you know, we call him Uncle Joe and all that stuff. In the meantime, Christ, he's, he he cleaned, he made Hitler look like a piker. He cleaned out 20 million people. Hitler only pumped out around, other than the war, about, you know, 6 million or so. So how can his military function, you know, based on, uh, at least in part, medicine, on certain distance? What you're telling us is that... Well, but remember, no, wait a minute, no, wait a minute, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back on that. Remember, when Hitler invaded Russia, what happened there? Remember, they wanted to be on Hitler's side. Remember, they all went against Stalin because of that. And then Hitler became behaved even worse than Stalin did, so therefore then it became a great patriotic war. You go read the history. You know, they were, so, they were so signing up. More yeah, so what happened, they said, Christ, this guy's even more medicine than Stalin. We'll keep Uncle Joe. At least he's one of us. <laughs> you read that. Early part of this campaign, apparently we're welcome to the German invaders. Finally, we're going to get rid of this goddamn mm -hmm. yoke we've had over our head. So you got to you got to be very careful when you examine them. That's why I'm saying you got to you know don't look at it in an isolated context. Understand the culture and you know just try to examine it from a total situation standpoint. See. And so maybe the, what's his name Shackle? I haven't studied this a little bit. Maybe you know look at it. Remember you can't just look at the Zulu. You got to look at the British. How are the British behaving toward them? And even though uh, Shackle's ideas and his actions might seem stringent, maybe what the British were doing to him were even more uncomfortable than what he was to do. Therefore, they could accept his measures because at least it was for the for the Zulus rather than for some foreign interloper, so to speak. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> 
but I would, I would look at that carefully. I mean, I can't answer because I'm, I'm totally unfamiliar with that. Okay. Any other questions? Before we hop out of here. Next week, is there any other options besides next week? No, this will be here. Oh, uh, well, it depends on how uh, long Colonel Boyd's going to be here. Uh, you know, I don't think you've really decided when you're going back. Uh, well, let, let me say, as I see the option, I, I, see the, I, I see Friday as an option. I think normally it's not going to What about tomorrow night? Tomorrow night. We may not be back. Uh, I, I'm well, just think, afraid to make you think the will keep us there? I don't know. Uh, but sometimes he gets wound up, and if he gets <laughs> wound up, I think all He's the commandant, and he wants us to stay. We stay. Well, well, listen, I just hate to make a commitment for tomorrow night. With that I understand. I understand. I really understand. hate to do it for tomorrow night. Um, so, I, sure, how long will it take for the wrap-up? What, this here? Yes, sir. Jesus, you guys, you got me very nervous. You know, I was supposed to do this in two nights. I'm afraid to make a prediction. <laughs> okay, I, I would say but our the wrap up there would take about, uh, oh, about 45 minutes, but I'm, I'm afraid to say that. I think we better allow it with two hours. Well, I'm afraid to make a commitment for tomorrow night. I'd say our options are Friday. And no, he's asking weekend. me the time. He asked me the time. Oh. I'd say we have to, no, just, I, I would say probably maybe 45 minutes to an hour normally. But, uh, go through, but I'm saying that we probably better allow two hours. How about during lunch on Friday? Yes, yeah. bring in lunch. Eat. I don't care. We don't have one. We've got a golf tournament. It starts at high noon. Tomorrow night, uh, if we could start maybe 1930. Uh, That's all right. It's more nice possible. Well, okay, we can set up for tomorrow night. Let's set it up for 730. And if we find out we're going to leave early, we can just move it up an hour. Tomorrow, if we find out we get time.